Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's Bounty Podcast episode. I'm Spectre. With me is Z. Today's episode features an accidental lock screen bypass in Google Pixel, some other vendor-specific Android volumes, and more. As a heads up, we'll be doing another uh, coverage stream this week. This week, we'll just be doing one day on Saturday, where we'll cover two to three talks from Hexacon at 6 p.m. Eastern and 3 p.m. Pacific. So make sure to tune into those, especially if you were uh, with us for our DEF CON streams and enjoyed those. Um, and also thanks everyone who tuned into those. Those were pretty fun as well. Um, and yeah, with that out of the way, we can get into our headlining topic, uh, which was an accidental, uh, block screen bypass in Google pixel devices. So this was fixed in a, uh, security update, the November, November 5th security update. Um, and it was vuln that was discovered accidentally when the researcher's phone died and had forgot their SIM pin code, uh, with the SIM locked. Um, so in order to reset the SIM code, um, you know, we had to enter the personal unlock key or, or puck key from the, the SIM's packaging. And after setting a new pin, um, they noticed some weird behavior where the phone would suddenly accept biometric unlock um, after reboot, even though the phone wasn't like unlocked yet. Um, and even after unlocking with the fingerprint, it further didn't actually start properly and it just hung on like Pixel is starting. So there was some weird behavior there. Um, kind of indicating, you know, it's worth looking at, seeing if there's something interesting there, and it turns out there was. Um, in the process of playing with it, they discovered that if they had a device in an unlocked state, they locked it, hot swapped the SIM, and then did the SIM reset process, um, they could bypass the lock screen to the home screen. So quite a significant bypass. Um, afterwards, when the issue was fixed and they looked at the commit, they were able to root cause it and found that essentially whenever um, Google had these security screens, um, so a security screen is just like, you know, lock, lock pin screen, SIM pin screen, fingerprint unlock, whatever. Um, whenever they had those screens um, on successful authentication for the, for the puck code, for example, they would call dismiss on the current security screen. Problem is that the Smith routine was vulnerable to race conditions because what happened if the current security screen would change in the background just before that dismiss call was invoked? Um, well, if that security screen happened to switch to the lock screen uh, pin, it could just dismiss that lock screen and authenticate you into the phone. So very interesting vulnerability, kind of a weird place to see a race condition. Um, uh, so the race itself was actually in the multiple calls to dismiss. So it wasn't actually in dismiss itself but in the fact that the puck view controller would all dismiss multiple times. And so after one of those dismisses, uh, other parts of the system would go and update the security screen to be like, okay, now show the lock screen. And then if you had that happen before all of the other dismisses were done, all those other dismiss calls, then it would dismiss. So that's where you get the race condition in there. Uh, but it was multiple calls to dismiss rather than just one. Yeah, fair enough. So yeah, like very interesting vulnerability. Um, the way that this was fixed was uh, Google just added a parameter to dismiss to specify exactly which screen um, they, they wanted dismiss. But yeah, like it wasn't like a simple one line fix or anything. It, the, the author was pretty surprised by, um, you know, how much effort was involved in the fix and how many lines of code changed. Um, cause you know, obviously they had to update all the calls and everything too. Um, now this attack of course would require physical access. Um, <clears throat> you basically need to perform like a SIM swap attack as well as, uh, have a few tries at the lock screens to get it to work. Um, you know, where it's the nature of it is being a race condition. It's going to take a few tries. So it would take some time to get it to work. Um, and you would need physical access, but that is still very much in the threat model for mobile devices. So, um, still a valid attack for sure. Um, and so, yeah, uh, just to clarify there, like it, a SIM swap is, is a separate attack. That's where like you call and you get like the mobile carrier to move your SIM or basically like move your, sorry. Yeah. I should have another SIM. Oh, I should have phrased that better. Swap like the you, SIM card. Yeah. You kind of hot swap the SIM to do this attack. It is physical, but I mean, the lock screen is very much a physical mitigation. It does also require that the device has al already been unlocked once. While the vulnerability still occurs on like the first unlock, that's where he just basically had the hang because if the, by default, now Android does the uh, encryption of the home directory, uh, if that's not decrypted, basically it'll dismiss the screen, but it can't actually read the content because it still hasn't had the pin. Um, uh, and I believe that'll include if you put your device into lockdown mode rather than just um, uh, rather than just the first move, but effectively it needs to already be able to be unlocked. 
in that way. Uh, so that is at least one case where um, it's not quite as damaging, but I imagine a lot of people aren't, you know, putting their phone in lockdown mode every time they uh, turn off the screen. Uh, so, yeah, pretty reasonable attack window. And I mean, the lock screen is kind of a physical defense. Um, most other attacks, when we're talking about like a browser exploit or something, the physical aspect isn't relevant. But like the lock screen isn't relevant for that either. Yeah, part of the reason I wanted to mention like the threat model and this still being kind of a valid attack is I have seen some discussion around this article saying, oh, you know, this isn't really a a practical attack or anything like that. And I don't think that's exactly fair. Um, sure, you know, it's it's not going to be used on like a mass scale because it does require physical access. But, um, you know, the, the entire point of the lock screen <laughs> is to prevent somebody with physical access from getting device to the phone. So, um, yeah, what you mentioned with with needing to be like uh, not the first unlock for the, the home drive to be decrypted um, is like a valid point to mention, but still, I don't think that's a huge block. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a pretty impactful chain. Um, and, uh, you know, as such, it was yielded a pretty good bounty, $70,000 bounty. Um, now I know there was a little bit of, um, interesting stuff with the bounty. So, um, Z, I think you looked into that a bit more, so I'll, I'll let you jump into that. Yeah. The whole bounty process was a little bit interesting on this one. Um, what ended up happening is he reported this actually there's pull up the feed. Um. So this author always publishes like the full bug reports also. So you can see like he reported it back in June and this thing get fixed until like the November release. And initially after a month he was told, okay, like, you know, issue gets triaged and then he's told it's a duplicate. So a bug that he was hoping for like a hundred thousand dollar bounty is suddenly zero dollars because it's a duplicate. Um months go by and what ended up happening was he was at Escalade, which is like Google Google conference for some of the bug hunters and stuff. I'm not sure exactly what the details are there, but there were some Googlers there who he showed the vulnerability to in a kind of live demo day for them. And that was on like September 11th, I want to say, mid-September. And about a week later is when the patch we looked at earlier was committed. So basically his looking at it as or showing it escalate prompted the actual fix so they did decide to give him the seventy thousand dollar bounty um and in doing so kind of noting we normally don't pay out for um duplicates but because your because your report is what actually made us um uh fix this issue they were going to pay it out which Kind of raised some questions about the initial report, whether or not it was should have even gotten the bounty in the first place. Uh, one of the things they call out is that the original bounty, or sorry, the original report didn't have reproduction steps, or they weren't able to reproduce it from the reproduction. I'm just looking for it here. Yeah, they say I'm, the same issue. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, to be fair, it seems like the, the researcher here didn't really know what, like, why this happened, because they had to, like, go back and look at the com the fix commit to understand why it happened. So in that way, I can kind of see why reproduction would be difficult. But yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, it sounds like you found what you were looking for there. I, know, I, I get that reproduction can be difficult, but there's kind of the question of if you report a bug that can't be reproduced, did you really report a bug? Um, like it happened once, but like a bug report kind of needs more information. And, you know, to give in this case, $70,000 bounty and also take it away from somebody who initially this was, you know, a $0 bounty he wasn't getting the bounty for this because it was a duplicate. Um, it kind of raised that question and, or that question just about, you know, is, is accepting the first report, especially if it doesn't lead to any bug actually being found. Should that be the case? And I don't have like a strong stance on this because I think you want to encourage bugs to be reported sooner rather than later. And researchers can always go ahead and update 
um, the report with like more information as they find it, but getting that information there and available quickly. But it also feels like a bit of a slap in the face to have a report marked as duplicate to somebody that wasn't able to triage or actually like reproduce the bug. Uh, so the yeah. quote I wanted to kind of bring out here was that um, I just pulled up on screen, but uh, the same issue was submitted to our program earlier this year. We were not able to reproduce the vulnerability. Uh, when you re when you submitted your report, we were able to reproduce the issue and began developing the fix, uh, which also maybe indicates that they were working on a fix before Escalate. It just the timeline kind of matches up where he shows it at Escalate to some Googlers. And then they have the patch like a week later. The timeline really seems to indicate that's where they pushed it, but it's possible they were working on it beforehand. Um, uh, but nonetheless, it, I can agree with people who are saying that, you know, perhaps the original person, presumably they were given the $70,000 bounty for their report. I'd be interested to see their report. I'm not sure anybody's actually dug that up or if it's even been made public. But it is an interesting concern here when it comes to dealing with duplicates. And I think that's a challenge for bug bounties in general. Um, because duplicates suck. Yeah, collision's never fun to deal with. Um, I'm trying to remember, I feel like there's one vendor we talked about somewhat recently, like within the last year, that would um that would like had a approach to try to deal with this, like Mozilla does a seventy two hours and they split the payout. Right, Mozilla. Yeah, you, your memory is like way better than mine. I so, looked it up because I was thinking about the same thing when I had a uh, discussion okay. about this. Uh, yeah, right. so Mozilla does that, and I feel like that's a better approach. But in this case, like that's just people reporting the same bug. It feels a little bit different when we're talking about a bug being reported that can't even be reproduced. Like, it's important information. I, I agree. I like, like, reproduction really matters with any bugs, or being able to guide them so they're able to fix it. Like, enough information that a fix can be worked on. But, like, I'd even be curious on how they determined it's a duplicate if the same issue was submitted earlier, but they couldn't reproduce it. Was it really a duplicate, or is there another issue, um, you know, in the same area? Yeah, that's a that's actually a fair point to bring up. But yeah, I mean, in general, um, I would even go as far as to say is like, yeah, in, in order to like get paid out for a bounty, I feel like you should have to provide reproduction steps. Um, because it's just like, if you if you submit like, here's a bug that happened, and there's no reproducer or nothing like, you're putting a lot of work onto the developer to try to figure out like what you're even talking about or to even confirm if it's a valid report like the triaging is just made so much more difficult um and yeah like yeah I, I feel like reproduction steps should be necessary for for payout in general um in this case i can kind of see why it was a little bit hard to reproduce where you know it's a race condition and where you if you didn't find the bug through like code review or something and just by the behavior um i could see that being like super frustrating to try to root cause um yeah there definitely and, uh, are you know some questions over what exactly caused in that reproduction step but mm -hmm. yeah i don't know i mean it stands out to me as something that something that just seems a little bit off with how bounty programs are run like this is kind of standard to not pay out on duty yet. uh that's at 130 in chat asks why not give 70k to both or coupons to google play um Probably not. Well, one reward is a lot to... worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not going to go for the coupon side, but 70k to both. So it sounds like that might be what they did here. So I don't know what bounty was paid out to the first person. If they got a lesser bounty because it couldn't be reproduced, but it was marked as a duplicate. Um, Neo Sabin is saying, you know, it says his was a duplicate in the article. Yeah, no, he mentions it here. Um, like, I've got it up on screen here. This issue was submitted. He still got a bounty for it. Um, just 70k one. It's, it's just that original report sounds like it wasn't a very good report or didn't really help them actually find the issue because they weren't able to reproduce it from the original report, whereas his, they could. Um, anyway, on the why not give 70k to both, 
in terms of paying out on duplicates, that's going to encourage, um, that can be very abused. So imagine I went, I found like a high paying issue. I go tell Spectre to go report it to and a couple other friends and we all, you know, uh, duplicate the money basically by paying out full bounties on duplicates. IRL um, money dupe glitch. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it kind of has that that sort of incentive problem. Um, it's also just gets very expensive. You report the if you pay out the same bug to everybody or the same bounty to everybody who reports a bug. Um, you know they are coming. They still want to be profitable. So like a bounty first first one who finds it or claims it, you know, gets it. It sucks if you're trying to make this as like a career doing bug bounty, but it it is a bounty that's you know. Bounties have been around for a long time, not just for bug bounties, but um, it, it, there is the profit aspect, I think. Comes uh, with the territory, you know. Yeah, um, no, it does. And, you know, it would suck. I, it's just. I don't know. This one raises questions because if it's two equivalent bug reports, first one gets it makes complete sense. In this case, though, where they're not. I don't know. I guess it depends on what they initially paid out to. I don't know if they would have paid out a full seventy thousand dollars when they weren't able to reproduce the issue. Um, so yeah, where we don't have the original report, I'm kind of hesitant to, um, like make too many comments because I, I just don't want to like comment on what I don't know. Yeah, there's um, a lot of assumptions I'm kind of made. Well, I guess I'm laying out different possibilities. Uh huh. Yeah, we're we're talking about it like in hypotheticals, and it's like if hypothetically the first report didn't have a lot of information and it was just like, hey, I encountered this bug, and um, you know, there's no reproducer or anything, then yeah, in that case, I, I feel like um, well, I mean, in this case, it worked out anyway. Like they got paid for the duplicate report, so that that's good on Google. Um, but in those types of cases, in general, like yeah, the better report should be ideally getting the payout. Um, especially if they're like somewhat close in, in terms of reporting time. But yeah, but then you also have kind of the flip side. Let's say you report an issue and you know, you put the information that you have and then like two weeks, you know, you think you're going to get a bounty and two weeks later, oh, somebody else submitted the same bug, but they had a better report. So we're going to pay them. Like this can also flip the other way too and kind of suck there. Or I See, think... I feel like a lot of these problems, though, can just be solved with minimum criteria. So it's like if your report doesn't meet the criteria of having like a reproducer and, and whatnot, then, you know, it, it doesn't get acknowledged. Uh, whereas the duplicate in this case would, you know what I mean? Um, Is it better, though, to encourage more reports of issues, even if you don't know exactly what's going on, to report it early? Uh, in my, in my opinion, out, not really. Wait? Okay, in I, my I opinion, think you not can really, have like, arguments going both ways. Because I, I feel like, you know, when you're talking about triaging and stuff, it's already, like, really not a fun job, especially if you have to go through a lot of them. So, yeah, like, I feel like having lesser reports but more useful reports is, like, a better system to have. Higher personally. quality reports. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think, like, Microsoft, I think with their program, they kind of pay out more if you actually provide good reports. Um, and yeah, kind of have do. the incentive on that, but you don't have a minimum requirement for your report. You can still push it out there. And with places like Google, they encourage kind of the early reporting, and then they'll pay out based on what they determine is like the maximum impact, rather than you needing to necessarily figure all that out first. Mm -hmm. um, so I do want to bring up one other case that I think would kind of suck for the bounty, and that is if that first report, because it didn't have a lot of information, didn't receive, you know, the full $70,000 bounty, but, you know, maybe only received, like, a fairly small bounty for, like, yeah, it's a bug, but we can't do much with this, or even no bounty, and then uh, the second guy here makes this report, has it closed as duplicate, and has kind of shafted out of the 70k bounty, and they didn't even pay out to the first person the 70k bounty. Um, that would kind of suck too. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I just I, I, I want to bring up that. that issue just as like that's a possible case that happened here too. We don't really know. Oh um, yeah. Yeah, I mean this there there's some questions over kind of the process here. Oh no, I I don't think Google's generally 
been terrible around the bounties. You know, they don't try and silence the bounties actually in this report when he's talking about doing an earlier disclosure, like before it's actually patched, um, just because it had been so long uh, between his initial report and it actually getting fixed. Um, they say, like, you know, we don't deny or allow the disclosure. Do it. It's not going to change anything. Um, yeah, which I mean, isn't that surprising? Like, Google seems to be one of those companies where it's like they're they're more um, open they're to open, yeah. um, coordinated disclosure kind of thing. Um, it, they do it with Project Zero. They kind of threaten yeah, exactly. their disclosure, too. They, yeah, they totally kind of set sense. the mark for that. Yeah. Oh. Um, it's just one of those cases where and then you've got things like Amazon where it's you sign an NDA and you don't tell anybody about it if you want a bounty. Yeah. Yeah, like you said, I feel like Google has enough good faith where it's like, you know, it just seems like it's a bit of an unfortunate situation. Um, don't know everything about the first report. If we did, we could maybe go a bit deeper on the discussion. But um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting case to be aware of, but uh, you know, end of the day, it is bounties. Um, collision is going to happen, and it's it's a difficult problem to deal with. There's not really a good solution that's going to make everyone happy. In this case, it you know it it might have worked out that way, like with with both people getting paid out. But in a lot of cases, that's not really going to happen. Um, Google's in a bit of a better position in these kinds of cases where it's like you know it's not like Google's like a small company, um, and you know, you know they're they're struggling to pay out bounties or anything like that. But when you're talking about smaller companies, um, this kind of situation is going to probably go a very different way. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. a it's a happy ending, I guess, to the to the post. But uh, it, it does raise some interesting questions, I agree. Yeah, and I, yeah. the issue itself, though, kind of jumping back on that, it's kind of interesting for I, I feel like we haven't seen a lot of lock screen bypasses. But a number that we have have been these kind of like weird issues, not the type of thing you'd necessarily expect, like not memory corruption, mm -hmm. not things or corruption, just these weird edge cases causing problems. It's a bit of a unique attack surface in the in the way that like um like the types of issues you're looking for, basically. Um, because yeah, the last one I remember was uh like the Windows uh bypasses, which I think was detailed by Secret Club. Uh, which might have been a while ago now, actually. I think that was like last, the end of last year. But yeah, we don't see them too often. So it's uh, it's always interesting to see when they pop up. And like someone said in chat earlier, this was a it was a pretty good write up. Uh, I like the way that, you know, it goes through things. And um, it's always fun when the vulnerabilities are found by accident. You know, it just, uh, you know, fate just makes it happen. <laughs> you end up stumbling on it. So. Because, yeah, like trying to find this issue in like code review or something probably would have been extremely difficult. Um, and it makes sense that it would be found easier through like weird behavior like that. So. Yeah. Uh, continuing on with Android, we have another post by Oversecured on some vendor specific vulns in Android uh, and ties in with their vulnerability scanner. They give a little bit of background on Android, which for the most part, I'll skip over here. Um, kind of doing like the cliff notes um, basically just talks about the fact that Android APIs and system services are implemented in jar files um, and like the system directory and, and whatnot um, and things like the activity manager and telephony manager are implemented as services which run under the system server which is privileged compared to untrusted and such um, and you can interact with those services through the uh, through the ADL or the uh, Android interface description language and obviously, all of these service APIs have to keep track of permissions and ensure that you have the proper permissions to perform some action, um, especially if it's sensitive. So one they give an example for is like rebooting the phone. Um, you, you know, a arbitrary third party app shouldn't just be able to reboot the phone, obviously. Um, one of the main permission mechanisms that Android utilizes for that is uh, UID. Um, the way Android uses UID is kind of interesting, actually. They basically use it as, like, app identifiers. Um, so, like, UID 1000, I believe, is, like, system. Um, and then, you know, third-party apps will get, like, higher UIDs. And um, higher UIDs are less privileged. Lower UIDs are, are more privileged, generally. So, yeah, this is kind of what they targeted their scanner to look at. Um, you know, looking at the control and data flow of these system services and looking at the permissions to access uh, what they call um, dangerous actions. So, 
Yeah, um, they looked at Samsung, which does a little bit more from a security perspective. Um, it has a bit of a larger permission set, um, some additional APIs, etc., which isn't really that surprising. For some reason, Samsung loves to like over engineer when it comes to security, and it usually ends up biting them, uh, like in this case. Um, yeah, so getting into or one of the issues. The Nox issues. <laughs> yep. Or that. That's a good show, too. So, uh, yeah, getting into the issues, um, one of the vulns they found was in the backup service. Um, so Android app backup, iBackup manager. Um, and yeah, so in the I have the screenshot up for those who can see this, the stream. Um, normally, this backup manager service has this method is backup enabled, which before returning, if it's actually enabled, we'll do a permission check. It'll check if you have the um, the backup permission before you know, returning if it's actually enabled or not. But Samsung added their own method, which just doesn't have that permission check. Uh, it just returns if it's enabled. So this is literally just like, let's just remove the permission check. Like, yeah, the logic here. <laughs> it's it's a weird one. Um, my guess is they have some sort of like system service or whatever that act that utilizes this and they just didn't want to deal with the permission for some reason i don't know um samsung's code is a little hard to explain at times so yeah that was a pretty straightforward like side door type issue um and i mean yeah, the another... benefit of it is maybe a bit limited like it's literally just telling you if backup is enabled oh yeah like that that doesn't feel that sensitive they found like 60 some bugs here we're only able to cover like three of them in this report um, yeah, the rest either haven't been fixed or at least haven't been disclosed yet. Yeah, it's a good example of the types of bugs they were looking for, though. So another vulnerability they found was in the storage manager service um, where it supported a intent um, of restart of SD card bad removed has APK, um, which can restart the phone and basically has no access controls. Um, so again, just kind of that idea of like, not really having privileges a um, little bit of a weird one and then finally inside of settings um, Samsung added some code into the settings homepage activity which would allow third party apps to access arbitrary activities and since settings has a system you would um, that would give access to non exported activities um, of any apps and you know um, you kind of have that user land escalation act factor which we kind of talked about how that could be useful in a recent project zero post last week by Maddie Stone um, so yeah, like some fairly like simple issues, um, not super deep or anything, um, but just kind of demonstrating the types of issues that they were looking for with their scanner. Um, yeah, the I think part of the one, reason. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, the last one feels really kind of stupid because it's basically like you tell when you're sending the intent, you just tell, yeah, I'm totally from search trampoline. There's no verification of that. You're just definitely from there. You include that boolean. It's like, okay, well, let's start whatever you want then. Like, there's just <laughs> no consideration here of what you can do from the system server. So of course, it has more privileges and it can just call in and start whatever. Um, and yeah, all you need to do is basically send it a Boolean. Well, I mean, you need to send it the right intent too, but the lack of validation's a little bit uh, crazy. Yeah. Um, so towards the end of the report, they say we revealed a large number of security problems in the Samsung ecosystem. And that's where they mentioned the more than 60 vulnerabilities um, that Z mentioned. And yeah, um, it's an interesting area to look for issues in these like vendor customizations of the Android user space. Uh, it's something that I don't think is looked at too, too much, um, especially because for a while, like you didn't really need to go this route. Like there were other um easier attack paths to go through. Um, but I've kind of said before, like as time goes on, attacking the user land instead of going for the kernel directly is probably going to become more and more um, useful uh, for attackers. So yeah, it makes sense. They're starting to, there's more research going into these types of areas. Um, seems to be an area that's, yeah, like vendors just don't really seem to get right or, or can easily mess up. Uh, and especially Samsung. Um, you know, I don't mean to go on like a Samsung hate tirade here, but for whatever reason, Samsung just loves messing with code unnecessarily. I've looked at like various Android drivers, um, both kernel and like some of the user space they, stuff they've done. And it's like they've customized it for like it basically does the same thing, but they replace the code with their own code for like no reason. Um, they seem to love like just rewriting things and How to put developers to work. 
Yeah, I guess. Like, I don't know. It almost does seem like busy work. But, um, yeah, like, it does cause this problem where, you know, as soon as the vendors start playing with these things unnecessarily, um, you have unnecessary fragmentation, which already plagues the Android ecosystem pretty heavily. So just adding on, like, more and more code differences makes it a lot more difficult to pull fixes from upstream. Um, it's easier for bugs to slip through the cracks and just you know, put in new bugs or, or side doors like the first issue. So yeah, uh, one of those things where Samsung just, you know, with their own weird practices of editing the code introduced a bunch of vulnerabilities. And uh, yeah, there's probably other vendors that are just as guilty of this. Um, although Samsung does seem to be the worst defender when it comes to like messing with Android. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's a good area to look at. Um, like I said, the issues aren't super interesting, but the attack surface is... Uh, kind of interesting and I think the there's some good background info in this post especially if you're not familiar with like the Android security architecture and how it has the permissions and stuff set up uh, I think this post could have some really useful things for you and you know if you're looking for like an area to research uh, the Android user space is probably a good place to to consider yeah one so. of the things I did like about this post is they are kind of just talking about you know, using fairly simple just data flow and um their new thing here was doing the control flow analysis. Um, it's it's just kind of showcasing again more of those Android and just mobile sort of issues where it tends to be these little permission things rather than really any crazy vulnerability. Um, yeah, in this case, it is like on those system services, but you'll see similar things with mobile apps just not doing the permission checks or... Um, I mean, not the Android permission, but just internally, like you'll see these same sorts of issues elsewhere, too, which is part of why I want to call this one out. And I also want to mention they do mention their scanner here, and it must be good because it tracks all known security issues on Android and iOS. All of them. Every every issue is covered here. Um, <laughs> I that was the one thing I didn't like about this post. Bit of a They're bold definitely, claim. And I mean, it is a marketing blog, so in, like it's fair for them to do it. But there are a few times where they really seem to, I'm assuming, overplay their, like, overplay the uh, scanner, especially because they're talking about how it can track everything, but, like, they just added control flow analysis and didn't do any of that beforehand. And elsewhere, I think they're talking about how they miss um yeah this meant we might miss a large a large number of vulnerabilities granted now they've added the new functionality in there so now they're capturing everything <laughs> I, I it's very you know promotional but the vulnerabilities are legitimate and stuff, so like there is some stuff there but i did feel some of the writing was i felt exaggerated felt marketing but it is a marketing blog, so fair enough. Yeah. I've never, um, so to be clear, I've never used the scanner. I have no idea how far it goes or how well it works. I did actually try looking at it, but you have to book a demo, so that's a no. Oh, okay, so it's not super accessible then. That sucks. Um, but yeah, I think what, what this post, uh, like the biggest offering of it is like some of that background information, especially when it comes to like the Android architecture and how the system services interact and stuff. Um, that is something where it can be kind of hard to get good, succinct information on it because a lot of like materials on Android are years old, um, like going back to a decade or more. So, yeah, I think that information can be useful um, if anybody's curious on that. Um, and yeah, just try to ignore, I guess, some of the marketing speak. There's uh, not a ton of it in here. It's just there There were the couple times reading it that it stood out to me. Like that line at the very end. You know, it tracks all the known security issues. <laughs> to be fair, I mean, it probably does track a lot of those high-level issues. But I yeah. feel like whenever you make that confident claim of everything is where I start to have doubts. All right, so uh, we'll get into our next blog post here, which is by uh, Sonar Source and is about uh, Check MK, which is like an IT monitoring solution. So, yeah, um, this was put out by Son Sonar Source. It's part two of a three part blog series. Um, part one kind of talks, talks about the architecture of Check MK and some of the background info, uh, as well as the volumes they found. And part two seems to focus more on the impact and exploitability. Um, Z, I'll let you get into this one. Yeah, and this one is basically just a crazy chain. Oh, 
So I'm just going to run through the whole chain. Uh, we've got the link in the show notes if you want to read part two. Or sorry, part one. Part one covers uh, the first two vulnerabilities, which is a server-side request forgery and a new line injection. And then they end up leveraging those two issues ultimately to get an authentication bypass in uh, this NugBiz application, which integrates with uh, Check. Check MK. So Check MK cookies are used on there. Very tight integration with it. Uh, so jump through with the issues. The SSRF effectively came because there is kind uh, of the UI, the main UI the users would use running on port 80. Um, and that's basically sounds like it's only exposed to local host. Um, so not meant to be exposed out to the internet. Not something you can actually reach. But there are things that need to communicate with it, network monitoring, sending stats around, doing whatever. So there's an agent receiver, and it's basically like a thin client. It, it generally just will take you know, re requests come in, and it'll forward it to that service on port 80, if, like, depending on what it's trying to do. It has some simple logic in there, but like it, it even mentions like it looks to see that you sent credentials, but it doesn't actually validate credentials at one point. It just forwards your request along. Uh, with the credentials you provide, expecting the actual UI to do it, uh, to do that validation, to see if they're correct. Uh, so that's where the SSRF happens, is basically in one of the endpoints in register with host name. Uh, what it will do is it'll take the request coming in, you have the credentials, you have a couple of JSON parameters, and it'll just forward it off to the actual endpoint running on port 80, the REST API. Um, and in doing so, it generates a path on there that is using the host name you provide directly in the URL that it actually calls. You'll see it crafts it here, object slash host config internal slash whatever host name you provide. So you can encode your slashes into a directory traversal, get the whole request to be made to any other endpoint on there, giving you a degree of access to the actual REST API. You can't directly access, but you can make requests through here. Um, if you don't have proper credentials, of course, that server is not going to accept them, but you can hit any of the endpoints, including those endpoints that are unauthenticated, uh, which is where the Ajax graph images endpoint comes in. Effectively, it's just creating image, or its point is just show like the performance of your servers, whatever perf information you want to show on there, it's just creating these images and how it does that is it will craft a um, live status query language. I've never heard of it before, but it'll craft this LQL query. Um, and in doing that query, the query is a little bit, or it seems like a bit of a weird query language. Um, allow me to just pull up. Yeah, so I've just pulled off kind of the example here where it's like get host groups, weight object, weight condition. And it's kind of got this key value sort of set off with new line delineated. Almost like headers. It's almost like a get, yeah, it's like, almost like an HTTP header kind of thing. Yeah, it feels very familiar to like HTTP headers. Uh so what happens is you've got this auth auth user parameter, uh, which can be sent as to, as part of the request, and all that's saying is like Show me the data that this user would be allowed to access. Um, and the way it fulfills that is it includes that as one of the headers it sends for the query. So auth user, they have the example foo here, but uh, because that's just coming from a URL parameter, which the attacker controls, they can go ahead and inject the new line and just inject an arbitrary, I'm going to call them headers here, and I guess they do also, but injecting headers into the LQL query. Um, one second, sir. Sorry about that. Uh, so they basically get that new line injection where they can use the SSRF to hit this endpoint to inject a new line into the query and start injecting their own headers. Um, and they play around with that a little bit more, and what they're able to do is use keep alive as one of the headers um 
so that when they inject just a blank line, which marks like the end of a query, uh, normally it would close that to keep alive being on will mean it keeps it open so you can start sending more queries down it, letting them now not only inject a new query or not only inject new headers, but by doing two new lines, they're injecting a whole new LQL query, uh, which means they now have access through the SSRF, the new line injection, to now craft arbitrary LQL queries. And one of the things those LQL queries, so you could pull out data from that part of the uh, second post, goes into doing blind data exfiltration, basically taking your standard uh, like SQL injection technique, create kind of a Boolean setup where you can ask yes or no questions, and then add in some sort of weight condition, uh, like sleep or benchmark in uh, classic SQL in order to determine like the yes or no using the time as your indicator. They use these weight object, weight condition, weight timeouts for that. Um, but what actually matters for the RC, so that's if you want to exfil any data, you can do that. Going for the RC or going, sorry, going for authentication bypass. Um, what they would lean on is you could basically provide a command request as part of these LQO, LQL queries. The command request, um, despite the name, isn't actually that powerful. Apparently, you used to be able to use that to actually get a uh, shell commands injected uh, back in like 2008, but they've kind of defended against that. Can't do that anymore. Um, it just provides, you know, whatever kind of internal supported commands there are. It's not shell stuff. Uh, but what they do provide is a process file command. And the process file basically just process file, file name, and whether or not it should be deleted using just if it's zero or falsy. It won't delete it if it's, you know, any value, basically. It will delete the file when it's done. And the fun thing about that is when it processes a file, even if it fails to process the file, fails to run commands, if, if everything just goes wrong, if delete is set, it still just deletes the file. Uh, so basically that gives them this arbitrary file deletion primitive um, where, again, they're going through this whole chain here, the SSRF into new line injection to inject a whole query to do this process file to delete arbitrary files on the system. Um, which would be a good chain on its own, honestly. But now they start going, well, what can they do by just deleting a file? And they go into targeting the CheckMK authentication system. Where, and honestly, reading this, I felt like I knew where it was going to go as it started talking about. But I really didn't. Um... What they've got are for the authentication system or mechanism, the session cookie has your username, session ID, and hash. hash it's, the hash is, of course, of the username session. A serial value, which is just like an incrementing number uh, based on how many times you've reset your password or been locked out or whatever. And a secret value. So not too surprising that they have like various values in there and they have a secret with the hash. So should be should be somewhat secure. Um, that secret is read from a file, so you might be thinking, well, just delete the file, and then it's going to have an empty secret. Fortunately, well, fortunately for them, actually, uh, it doesn't work that way. You can't just delete it. It'll craft the file again. Um, so it'll, if it sees that the file is empty or, like, doesn't exist, it'll just make a new one with a new secret. So it actually does it securely and have these layers of defense here. Uh, but what they found... Oh, uh, you know, it'll just recreate it. But they also found, as I mentioned, this NogViz. Probably not saying that accurately, but um, its integration with that system, that was written in PHP rather than Python. And what they would do is they would check if the file existed, or they would try and read it. Um, trying to bring up that code now. Yeah, they just read it, file get contents, trim it, um, and use that as the secret. Since it would get a warning if it didn't exist, it would fail. So they still couldn't just delete that file. But they could abuse these two different implementations and kind of found a race condition in them. Where if you deleted the file 
And then for for that brief period on the Python version, it's going to be recreating the file with the new secret value. It's going to create the file and then write to it. So for a very brief moment, the file has been created, but the content is empty. And if at that moment they hit the PHP endpoint, to have it try and load the secret, it would load an empty secret um, that they could then basically predict and craft the uh, actual um, and craft the actual cookie and get a proper login. Uh, so honestly, I've explained that it is a yeah, Rudimal says that's one long chain. Yeah, this is a crazy chain going from server side re blind server side request forgery, new line injection, injecting a new LQL query using that new line injection, using that query to process a file and get it deleted, and racing the authentication during like the uh, recreation of that file. Might be the longest chain we've ever covered. If we're being honest about it, it's an awesome um, chain, though. But yeah, that finally we're kind of done there. Um, you're able to get into NogViz and authenticate there, uh, where uh, presumably you can get code execution. They don't really talk about where the RCE comes from. It is an RCE chain, so maybe that's in part three yet. So maybe this chain goes on. Oh, they do say, you know, the attack requires a few attempts, but it can be reliably exploited to gain access to not this. Um, and once, yeah, they just mentioned once you've crossed or once you've gotten in there, you've crossed the security boundary and the exposed attack services further. In. Oh, yeah. So they, they actually do say a bit further down uh, in the next article, uh, we will continue where we left off. This allows the attacker to exploit an authenticated arbitrary file read in NogViz, which can be used to gain access to the check MK GUI itself. Um, oh, and so then they another... take a look at an authenticated code injection vulnerability. So there's more. Another chain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, granted, once you're in there, you kind of get to restart. It's like it's it's chained, but it, it's not a single exploit, if that makes sense. At least in my head, I would definitely see a separation. You're in like a second stage attack. Yeah, kind stage of. is yeah. a good way to put it. But yeah, yeah, I mean, reading this, it's just really good post about, you know, doing this sort of chain. And also, I mean, and they call it out here, the reminder of defense and depth, you know, kind of matters. All of these vulnerabilities, and yet they couldn't do a ton with each one, but they had to keep chaining them and chaining them into this fairly complex system to finally actually do something of value. Um, Whereas in other cases, they might just have like SSRF and then, oh, well, this is running on port 80. So who are like local host? So who cares? You know, you treat everything as authenticated. It seemed plenty of applications like that. But no, they did the authentication. They had all of these layers that you had to get through in order to actually abuse this. So, I mean, good job on their team on it. Yeah, and whenever you have um, defense in depth that forces chains, especially when you're getting to this insane length and it's on the web, um, your attack becomes way more fragile. Uh, as soon as like one component is patched, your entire chain could end up breaking and you have to rework it. Like um, forcing longer chains is a really effective uh, defense technique. Um, they're just defense strategy overall. So yeah, I mean, that's kind of proven here. Um, I think the my favorite part of at least this blog post, the second part here, is how they leverage the file deletion. Because, um, you know, when you look at that, you're like arbitrary file deletion. You're like, OK, that sounds kind of neat. But like, how do you use that? It doesn't seem like super obvious how you'd be able to escalate that to something more useful. Um, but then, yeah, when you pair it with like that race uh, to be able to get like an empty secret, like that's a really cool aspect of it. Um, and I, I thought that step was was really neat. So, yeah, I'll be honest, since I read this, I was really expecting them to. Like, so many times, like, oh, well, just, you know, there's a secret, just deleting the source of the secret, you're good. Um, and it's going to go with the blank, and nope, doesn't work on Python. Oh, and then they found this mysterious, uh, or I guess not mysterious, but they found the PHP interface. Oh, so they're just going to delete it and have it impact there. Nope, it, that also did it securely. I very much was thinking they would delete, like, the secret file, because that is, that is one of the ways I've seen file deletions used before. Or like abused before, um, yeah. But yeah, the, they took it a. I mean, not really a different route, but the way they had to exploit with that race condition, I think, was a kind of final cherry on top for this. 
Like, it's it's yeah. a cool chain. Uh, Balika mentioned obfuscation also works to a point. I don't really consider obfuscation defense in depth. Um, I don't think you can really put it in that box because I mean... defense in depth mostly just hits attackers, whereas uh, obf- obfuscation hits defenders too, <laughs> like or like good guy security researchers, I guess you could say. Um, I, I don't really consider it like part of the same thing, really. Uh, uh, obfuscate the file system so the attackers don't know what to delete. Okay, that, that'd be pretty funny, but... <laughs> yeah, I uh, mean, Belika mentions it works to a point. Obfuscation, you know, it, it... It hits both sides, both the attackers and the defenders. Yeah. But it does hit the attackers. So it does have... It does, but, like, what I'm saying is, like, I don't think it's worth it. <laughs> so. And I agree with you. Um, I, I don't think it's worthwhile to hinder uh, those on the defensive side. Uh, just to make it a little bit harder on the attack side. Because the attack side just has more time to invest than the defenders. It's also just so lazy. Like, you, you gotta appreciate a lot of the defense and death work that went on in this... Um, product that Sonar Source is covering, Check MK. Like th- that took a lot of effort and thought to design the system that way, where they had to make the chain this long. Whereas you know anyone can throw an obfuscation pass over code or something. You know, um, it's it's not really like uh, comparable in like the amount of effort and effectiveness. So yeah, it sounds like it's also a bit just an indication of maturity. Um, because they do call out that like in two thousand and eight. You were able to uh, use that LQL injection, use the commands, or be able to issue commands that could actually result in code execution. Uh, they fix that, and, you know, it makes it sound like it is also the sort of thing where time after time of getting exploit and actually taking care to fix them, it adds up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good takeaway, too. All right, so uh, we'll get into our last blog post here, which is uh, one by a researcher by the name of Mr. Madi, and it's about a client-side path traversal attack, um, well, about them in general and their exploitability, um, using a bug they found in Acronis as a case study. So the post first uh, starts off by talking about what a client-side path traversal is, um, which is, you know, when some content is loaded and the attacker has some control over the path to the resource. Um, and, you know, if that's not sanitized properly, it could lead to like XSS or CSS injection or whatever. Um, and one of the first things it talks about is how you can actually test um, for these issues. Um, you know, one of them being the obvious, you know, read the JavaScript code and try to find parameters that would make its way into the URL paths. Um, or another being to inspect the, uh, the HTTP requests and try to find some controllable input that way. Um, though they mentioned that, that way you could end up missing things because you're reliant on knowing which parameters exist and which are vulnerable. Um, the approach he mentions as like an alternative approach is to combine both of those approaches. Um, so, you know, check for parameter reflection in the uh, the XML HTTP requests, then study the JS to understand how that parameter is handled. So this is where it starts to get into the Acronis case study um, where there was a load profile and branding function, which was called on login. Um, seems to be just like, you know, um, styling the page or whatever, loading the user's preferences. Um, and it would call make CSS link with the color scheme get parameter to load the CSS. Um, so this was a local load, but it could be used to get path reversal to get some other CSS loaded um, because it wasn't sanitized or anything. Um, which, like I said, locally that wouldn't be super useful. It probably wouldn't be security sensitive unless there was some like malicious local CSS file already present. Like you could upload one or something. Um, the other case where this could be escalated further, though, is if you have an issue like an open redirect or something to chain it with. Um, and that's kind of where this where it went in the the Acronis case study. Um, in that case, you could just use the path traversal to hit the open redirect endpoint and potentially load a resource from an attacker server, um, which he then talks about when he found in the authorized API endpoint for redirecting. Um, kind of a bit of an obvious open redirect, just, you know, it had the like redirect URI and it seems they, they didn't like... Uh, Protect it or sanitize it or, or whitelist so it or actually, whatever. Actually, no, actually, it seems like it is a little bit more interesting on that open redirect because it's not the redirect URI that's getting. I mean, it is. So the normal OAuth flow, you hit the start endpoint, it usually uses the state value as just like a random anti C surf sort of token. 
um it's just meant to be like this is a unique value so you can't do like like sort of thing um but the normal oauth flow is a user you send uh the sorry you send like the victim off to the normal oauth endpoint it redirects them off to the identity provider who then uses that redirect url and redirects them back to the original place with the code and then when they go back to the original place with the code here, see it calls back, has the callback, has the code. Um, and when state is pointing to local host, it basically just redirects them again down here, location, local host. It's redirecting them based off of that state value, which is completely weird. I have no idea why it's doing that. Oh, oh right. Okay. Doing so it. I was. What? Yeah, sorry. No, I was, I was when I was looking at it, I thought they were taking advantage of the redirect URI. But yeah, I see what you're talking about now with the state. Um, yeah, I don't recall like ever seeing this kind of flow before in like other open redirect type issues we've covered. No, I've never seen state use like that. That stood out as unique to me. Ultimately, it is just that's an open redirect and all that. But um. Just weird. So it's a bit interesting how it happens. Yeah. Weird that it would, yeah, like I could imagine what they're doing there is they're instead of implementing like just a proper random state value or not even using state, um, they're providing like they're adding this in as their own functionality to redirect away from like the idea being to use this internally to redirect to their own pages rather than having a bunch of valid redirect like catch pages. Like, that's likely what they're doing with it. It's just, it does seem like a weird way to use it. At least when I've looked at OAuth implementations, perhaps others have seen it being used this way before. I'll be honest, a lot of, most of the time when I'm using an OAuth flow, like, and not auditing, I'm not really paying attention to exactly how all the redirects are working. So maybe others have done this too, but it, it really surprised me here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in this case, they were able to chain the uh, the path traversal to hit the open redirect endpoint, um, which then leads to CSS injection, uh, where they could exfiltrate info from the DOM through CSS properties um, using the attacker server. So kind of a cool attack chain, uh, mostly just talking about client-side path traversal and how it could potentially be exploited. Um, but as the post mentions early on, like it is going to be context-specific. It's going to depend on the setup of the target. Um, but yeah, just kind of like giving some ideas uh, of how you could both look for um, the client-side path traversal and how it could be escalated. So yeah, fairly quick post, um, but has some cool information on on those types of issues. Yeah, as, as an issue, that's what stood out to me. Like this client-side path traversal is something I would easily overlook as not really having a huge security implication. You're able to access other pages that you can already access. Uh, yeah. It's only in the chain. Like, on its own, you see that. I'm not sure I'd necessarily report it or even really think about too many. Like, now, obviously, I would having this pointed out. But initially, I'm not sure I would have even thought about using it with an open redirect. I imagine if I were in this case where it's loading the CSS, I'd have tried breaking out. I'd have you know, tried getting it to go be parsed out to some other location. But I'm not sure I'd have gone, even thought to try finding an open redirect and getting it that way. Uh, so I thought it was a really cool tactic just for that idea. And maybe it's not a novel idea, I'm not sure. Uh, but this is one of the first times I've uh, seen it come up. So yeah, I kind of wanted to include the post just for that. Uh, Rudimo does mention ASLR is just address obfuscation, by the way. No. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> no. I disagree. Um, because, like, the thing there is, like, um, I mean, this is getting a little off topic. Sorry for people who only tune in for the bounty stuff. This is getting a bit into binary. But SLR generally requires you to add an additional bug into the chain, which plays into the defense in depth I was talking about earlier. Um, so, yeah, it does have value beyond obfuscation. Like, um, I, I, I wouldn't quite classify it that way. But anyway. Yeah, just to address that from chat. But yeah, it like is you said, a sort of obfuscation. It does make the defender side harder, you know, when trying to debug and stuff too. Um, I I agree with you that it has more value, but at its core, it is an obfuscation. Um, and I think that's just more like not all obfuscations are the same. Either like what we were just talking about earlier was really like obfuscating the application, not 
Yeah. Not that sort of obfuscation, but yeah, there are because encryption in a sense is obfuscation. Oh, uh, and obviously crypto has a place. Yeah, but, to oh, be fair, no, I, I guess it, it was... is a talking point, but uh, yeah. it's kind of a funny one. I, I thought it was one. a funny point to raise. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like you said, like jump back to this blog post. Uh, yeah, it, it makes you think a little bit and, uh, you know, something you keep a lookout for when, when considering open redirect issues or, um, sorry, um, client side patch reversal issues and how you can chain those with open redirect issues. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's basically all the topics that we have for today. Uh, Z, unless you have any last minute things you want to bring up, we'll go ahead and wrap up the show. Yeah, no show notes this week. All right, cool. So that's where we'll end it off. Thank you, everyone who tuned in. You can catch the VOD on Twitch immediately or on other platforms like YouTube tomorrow. We also have previous podcasts up on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more links on Anchor. Um, if you want to join our Discord and follow us on Twitter, links for those are down below or in the chat. Again, this week on Saturday, we'll be covering Hexacon Talks at 6 p.m. Eastern and 3 p.m. Pacific. We don't know exactly which ones yet, but, you know, closer to the date, we'll let you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll send out the notifications for that on, on Twitter and Discord. Uh, so remember to keep a lookout for those. And with that said, we'll be back tomorrow with a binary episode at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, and we'll see you all then.